Um, that applause does surprise me. <laughs> but I quite liked it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to tell you a story today about uh, myself. And um, it's going to be about measurement, because that's my thing. I like to know what, what something is, and I like to understand how it's measured. And um, it's, it's linked a bit to my background. Uh, and my first degree was in psychology, and I have been a researcher. But I've also been a research participant. <coughs> and it was funny how that came apart, or how it came about. And um, when you look at me, I know you're probably thinking, what a cool guy. <laughs> um, he comes on stage, he talks to people, we laugh. It must be great being him. And it is, it is. It's great being here. But it wasn't always like this. Um, when I left university and took up my first job, I was a lecturer. Um, but I really did have difficulty in starting up conversations with um, people, particularly members of the opposite sex. And I shared this concern with a friend of mine who didn't seem to have this difficulty at all. And he said, well, the, the trouble with you is, you put people on edge. And you, you, you frown all the time when you're talking to them. And when, when you do that, people think you're being critical. So they don't enjoy carrying on the conversation. You should follow the royal rules. What are the royal rules, I said. He said, oh, it's what the royal family have trained them they have to meet lots of people and put them at ease. Uh, tell me more. Well, <laughs> when the Queen is introduced to somebody, she will ask, have you come far? And the person will probably say, oh, uh, I've just come in from Kirk and Tilly. And the <laughs> Queen will say, oh, Kirk and Tilly. We know it very well. Philip and I were there just the other week. We think it's a lovely place. And the person goes, wow, they like the place I come from. <laughs> And as that dries up, the Queen moves to her second rule, which is to say, what's your line of work? And a person might say something bizarre, like, oh, I'm a cross-stitcher in a quilting factory. And the Queen is trained to say, ah, Philip and I were discussing our quilt just the other night. <laughs> a moth-eaten old thing, referring to the quilt, I think. <laughs> Perhaps I should uh, send Philip along with it to you and you could put a new cover on it. And uh, the person would say, oh, we'd be honoured to do so. Everything about this conversation means that the person feels good about themselves and also feels good about the Queen. So I thought, wow, that's not too difficult, I'll try that. So the next occasion that occurred, when I happened to be in a bar, and there was a lady, attractive lady, sitting on the rally, I went across and sat down beside her leaned forward and said, can I ask you a couple of questions? <laughs> Shrug, which I assume means okay. And I said, uh, have you come far? And she looked at me for a minute and then said, no. Said, oh, God, I'm lost. <laughs> Go to the second question. What's your line of work? And she replied, she was a clinical researcher. I went, ah, oh, life belt. I know something about research. So I said, what are you clinically researching? And the answer that came back stunned me. And I think it would have stunned the Queen too. Because <laughs> what she replied with was that she was clinically researching in a laboratory experiment the effect of alcohol on male sexual arousal. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> And I wondered, well, what would the Queen have said to that? <laughs> would she have said, uh, oh, Philip and I were discussing that just <laughs> quite He's absolutely hopeless now. A couple of gins, you can't get anything off it. And then I thought, no, 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 the Queen would not have said that. She'd probably have said what I was going to say, which was, how do you measure the effect of alcohol on male sexual arousal? And she explained that what they did was that they advertised for men to come to the laboratory, and then they gave them a standard amount of alcohol, vodka and tonic, in 
three quarter pint glasses and uh, related to their height and weight. So everybody got the same concentration of alcohol. They then gave them a stimulus, an erotic stimulus, which was provided through headphones of an erotic story, varying degrees of eroticism. And uh, then there was a measuring device. A sensitive electronic measuring device. Placed in the appropriate place. Now you're probably ahead of me here. <laughs> question and I said because I was intrigued now and I said um, <coughs> do you have any difficulty in getting volunteers for this experiment and to cut a long story short the following Friday <laughs> <laughs> I found myself in the sexual arousing measuring chair <laughs> of the drugs and alcohol rehabilitation center at Leicester University staring out the window listening to the monotonous information that's given to you when you're in one of these trials. And, you know the sort. Beep, you're about to get a tape recording with some erotic arousal information. <laughs> a measure will be taken at the beginning and at the end of each stage. There are three stages. And the measure difference will dictate whether you are not aroused, medium aroused, or highly aroused. So, I was getting ready to be one of those. <laughs> when something caught my attention out the window, and it seemed to be a man on a ladder waving. <laughs> to my horror, I realised it was a team of window cleaners. And they were heading my way. Well, I thought, what shall I do? And I looked down and I looked up and I thought, oh, heavens. And this could be very embarrassing for both of us. And um, I thought, time them. And then find out how much time I've got and see if I can get through this experiment. And it was 30 seconds suds on, 20 seconds suds off, 20 seconds down the ladder, 10 seconds move the ladder along one. And there were four windows away. So I was calculating away whether I had enough time or not, when suddenly a voice cut in and said, that completes the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard any of this at all. <laughs> you have scored zero, zero, and zero <laughs> on the arousal scale. That completes the experiment. You can take your headphones off, remove the device, adjust your jest to normal, and return to the administration room where the administrator will deal with your <coughs> um, travelling expenses, etc. <laughs> so I did as instructed, got myself redressed and into this room, and lo and behold, there was the administrator, was the woman that had signed me up. And I think there was a hint of a smile on her lips as she said, right, uh, Dr. Stevenson? Yes. She said, can I ask you a question? Have you come far? <laughs> oh! That's <laughs> <well, I'm sorry. laughs> very funny. Ha, ha, ha. The royal rules being played back to me. So I said, right, royal rules to you then. We are not amused. But quick as a flash, she said, no, no, you were not aroused. We were highly amused. <laughs> now, what I drew from this and have held with it in all my career in research is that when you are involving human beings in research, you need to include them as participants and co-researchers. And you must find out that the stimulus that you provide does actually get through to the individual. Otherwise, you can't get the connection of whether the stimulus has produced the response. And the other thing that I've kept with me all this time is that window cleaners work bloody fast. <laughs> <laughs>